in order to keep growing, we need to create the world outside of the planet. So if we build a space elevator, this would allow us to kind of like to take a train to, I mean, to lower orbit. I'm not saying Jupiter. I'm saying lower orbit where, where the space stations are. Hello and welcome to The World As It Should Be, a podcast in which we ask our guests to tell us what they would change to help create their perfect world. By listening to what they'd like to change, we'll hear more about who they are, what they do and what inspires them. This podcast is brought to you by the team behind Prima Donna, a uniquely anarchic and joyous festival of everything creative. My name is Shona Abianka and I'm a book publicist working with some of the most thought-provoking authors writing today. I'm Catherine Riley, a writer and director of the festival. We're delighted to be your guides on this podcast adventure. The world as it should be from Prima Donna. Author Paula Aloitcherak was born in Buenos Aires and now lives in Barcelona. She has written three novels and is a regular contributor to the New York Times, El Pai and La Nación. In 2010, she was chosen as one of Granta's best young Spanish novelists. And more recently, she won the Eccles Centre and Hay Festival Writers Award. Paula's most recent book, Mona, is about to be published in the UK. It was chosen as the best book of the year by the New York Public Library, Book Forum, AV Club, Lit Hub, Thrillist and Red Book. Quite a list. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's lovely to have you. You're over in Barcelona at the moment. Yes, yes. I'm living in Barcelona. Just right. I moved here like right before the pandemic. So I kind of arrived and two weeks afterwards, the confinement started. So it was quite a way oh to get God. to And what tempted you to Barcelona? Well, I was kind of like uh, running away from Argentina because things got, had gotten a little rough. Um because, you know, there was this government change and et cetera. And I knew that it was going to be like, I mean, complicated for journalists working there. And, and well, it has. So a lot of people are fleeing Argentina right now, even if they're not journalists, just because there is like, you know, a massive crisis, which is quite cyclical at, at the same time. Like we're kind of like used to it, but yeah, it's, it's horrifying. So if you can't, I mean, most people who can just leave. Mm. So we're kind of like populating the world, like Argentines all around. But your family are back in Buenos Aires, are they? Yeah, I mean, my mom is in Buenos Aires, my dad's in Buenos Aires, and yeah, yeah, and my friends are there. <laughs> you're settled now in Spain, you're enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it's quite lovely here. It's, um, yeah. uh, I don't know, we have a little community of, you know, I don't know, of, of no, not necessarily experts, but like, I mean, Latin American people that uh, that live in Barcelona and, and it feels like, you know, it's, 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 it's very lively. It feels like as if it was Buenos Aires, but like without all the drama, <laughs> without, <laughs> without, you know, all, all the terrible things that had happened as if, if, as if Buenos Aires had kept growing and like being awesome and everybody's happy. So it's, it's quite nice. And there's the beach. Yeah. That's a great strap line for Barcelona tourism. <laughs> like Buenos Aires. Without all the shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just send that over. <laughs> um, so tell us, about, um, tell us about Mona. Tell us about your book. What, what, what's it about? What do you want it to achieve? So I, I, I started writing Mona um, and, and, I, and I wanted to do a book really centered on, on this woman character who would... Um, would have like this avidness for the world, but at the same time, you know, have to be like being to in professional places as such as, you know, I mean, she's a writer. She goes to Sweden because she's going to this literary festival at the same time, like she's getting into travel as, as, as any, you know, young woman would do as in, you know, like, I don't know, getting seduced by people and like having drugs and, and at the same time, like running away from something that she does, she's not really sure what it is. But I also, one of the things that I really wanted to do was um, I had been like, you know, when I was growing up, like reading, you know, Henry Miller and Bukowski and, and Martin Amis and all these guys, they were kind of like the bohemians, you know, of, of, of you know, bohemian writers that were like, you know, having amazing lives. And at the same time, you know, like drinking and, and writing poems on the backside of, you know, the, the, the <laughs> lady friends. And, and I was like, no well, way, I mean, there are no like female characters like that who are also, you know, like enjoying themselves in the world and like kind of like being, I mean, like getting into travel massively. Um, but also like being really concerned about, you know, like what is to be, I mean, a creative person in, in the world and what is to be a creative woman in the world. So, so I really wanted to explore that, to have that kind of a character. And so that was kind of like what, what organized Mona. 
there, you you mentioned it then, and there, there's like these brilliant caricatures of like literary fellows and and uh, people who are literary greats in some way or another. Like one one of them quotes as in his speech, like just copies, plagiarizes. Is it Beckett? Just reads out chapter uh, paragraphs of somebody else's work as a flagrant kind of plagiaristic moment and gets away with it because he's just considered to be a great writer. How fun was it to? to send up that kind of literary world to, to, to kind of poke, poke fun at it? Well, I mean, I'd been having a lot of fun. And at the same time, I used to, I mean, have a terrible time because I was super nervous. I didn't know how to, I was very anxious socially. I didn't know how to engage, which is, you know, which is very normal when you are, you know, among humans and, 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 and well, and, you know, you're alone and it's days and days, etc. And, and one of the things that really helped me to, to move better in this world was just, I mean, to treat everybody as a character. So when I arrived <laughs> in a place, I was like, oh, great. So my, my novel is my life. So I'm meeting the character. He's doing this. He's doing that. So so the reality became enchanted for me. And and it's it's kind of like, I mean, a way that I kept on doing. Like, so, if, you know, if I go to a place, like, I don't get bored anymore because I just feel like, Okay, so this character is doing this. I mean, she wants me to notice something or there's something going on behind. And so I just keep, you know, this is, I mean, this is helpful and, and, and kind of healing for me. And, and so, well, and at the same time, like, of course, I would like after like having all these experiences, I would just, you know, go back to bed and write or take notes all the time. And so this, this was like really a, a way to be alive in the world and writing at the same time because I would be taking notes all the time. And that's also a beautiful thing um, that I think I learned from Shabok Shishek, which is this, I mean, fantastic philosopher. Um, he says that kind of the secret to write is never to write. You're either taking notes or editing the notes, but there's no like <laughs> writing moment. At the same time, I love the writing moment because the writing moment is like, oh, this phrase, like tuning it up and like making it beautiful. That's, I mean, that's a really, really fun part of it. But if you want to strip out of that and just like take, I mean, like, like the meat, you can just like stick to taking notes and editing the notes. And then, you know, the book will, will be, you know, at some point you will have a book. So it's awesome. And so do you have characters in the novel which you had to disguise because they're based on people? Oh, Yes. I, I love doing that. I, because it's like you I don't know it's like you have this person and, and you're like dressing them up and, and it's it's very fun like like um because I, I wouldn't want anyone to to feel offended and at the same time I think that people that would feel offended would also kind of like love the fact that that yeah I mean yeah I mean I'm obnoxious so what's so bad about that <laughs> and so I I, I I don't know. I like, I like that part. I, I like, you know, to, I don't know, to connect with humans in that sense, because it's beautiful to kind of be out there and, and I don't know, and be horrible sometimes, you know, and like, there's some vanity out of it. And well, you know, you were horrible, but maybe you're going to make a great character in someone's book. Yeah, but they were memorable. Yeah. That's the thing, isn't it? They Absolutely. say that indifference is worse because and nobody really remembers. Yeah. So I'll, I'll save them. I'll take them to literary, I mean, heaven in the form of a book. <laughs> <laughs> there's some redemption for the horribleness <laughs> absolutely we as you know run a literary festival so i'm already thinking of just record like putting a recorder in the green room next year <laughs> this summer rather than just making a novel very quickly in that way but one of one of the people that co-founded our festival kit deval is who's a, a novelist as well she says uh, don't fuck with writers will describe you <laughs> which is exactly. basically what you're saying as well it's a really good line yeah, yeah. very 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 uh tricky people very yeah. so when you, <laughs> kind of, did you have a notebook so when you were meeting all these people were you kind of then scurrying off and scribbling something they said because don't, you don't want to forget it I don't think I even like go out without my notebook everywhere <laughs> with me. Like I say, like, yeah, I move to the kitchen. I'm working at Pavlova right now. I have the notebook with me. It, anywhere I go, it's just like, it's there. It's going to be recorded. So watch out. Dedication. <laughs> well, don't write about us, please. <laughs> <laughs> You're too beautiful. I'm just, I'm, but I need more. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got time. Let's stra strap in. <laughs> what kind of Pavlova are you making? Just, you know, whilst we're talking about baking. Oh. I, I uh, well, I'm making the the strawberry pavlova. There, well, this is recipe by Nigella Lawson that I love. Oh, Nigella is uh, Nigella. Yeah, she's wonderful. Great. 
Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm so annoyed. This is virtual. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Have you made her? Um, I'll tell you my favourite cake: Nigella's chocolate Guinness cake. Oh, I haven't tried that one. It's amazing. I, I, it's in, in a book called Feast. Oh, okay. Feast. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is the third time Shona's has mentioned this book, this cake. <laughs> sorry, this week, and it's her birthday soon. So she keeps talking about this cake. <laughs> I'm gonna have to fucking make this cake, and I. I have to wait till April. I can't wait. Oh, well, so April is the best, the coolest month, but it's the best month as well. It is. It's your birthday in April. Oh. So nice. No, no, but no, I was just quoting you know, T.S. Eliot, but, but no. my, my birthday is on, it's on September, September 13th. Sorry. Oh, oh, that's my, my mother's birthday. So that's also oh, a very good day. Anyway. Perfect day. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about before we move on to your, your three things is um, you, obviously you write in Spanish, you, you, that is your first language, but um. And so the the version of your book that I read was translated. How closely do you? I'm just interested in that process. Like, how closely do you work with a translator? How do how do you make sure that the what you're trying to say is is accurately captured by a translator writing in a different language? Yeah, well, I uh, worked very closely with with Adam, who's an absolute genius. Um, right. We, we became friends in San Francisco, and and he's so. I mean, he knows very well the like, contemporary culture, and he would like he, he would. The thing is, when you're writing a book that has humor, you have to kind of like adjust the yeah. pitch when when you're moving on to another culture, which is you yeah. know, the English language. So in order, you know, not to sound harsh or just like, I don't know, maybe, you know, like not sound good. I mean, you really had to tune in the pitch and, and he was great at that. And so we, we worked together and, and it was great because I absolutely love him and he's he's fantastic he's he i mean he has he writes great prose he wrote this book called american messiahs so he you know he knows a lot about like arcane americana wow amazing and so will you be taking your book to festivals this summer is that part of your plan or oh is know. it covid I mean, dependent if any festival would have me because I well can... <laughs> i can i can definitely invite you to one <laughs> i can wait to I, I can bring the cake um, amazing. Oh, well, then you're definitely coming. Headline slot. <laughs> amazing. Okay, well, let's yeah, talk about to that. The, to the Edinburgh Literary Festival in August. Okay, cool. And then that's super, I'm super excited about that because I've never been to Scotland. Oh, it's beautiful. Edinburgh is absolutely beautiful as well. And the festival is so good. But Prima Donna Festival is also good. And it's on the, cool. the end of July. Yeah, oh, yeah. Cool. Let's talk. Let's talk. Okay, let's move on to your um, your three things for creating the world as it should be, um, which is what we're all about. Do you want to um, explain the first one and talk us through it? The first one, oh, to end the dictatorships in in Venezuela and in Nicaragua and in Cuba. Six million people have fled Venezuela so far. I mean, we have engineers that are making odd jobs or cleaning toilets. Uh, in different parts of Latin America, even here in Spain. Um, and of course, in Cuba, this has been happening since the 60s or before. Nicaragua is jailing writers. But the thing is, well, nobody has nothing to win anymore by saying, you know, this has to stop. It's like really like bad publicity for the US, for example, to stage a coup or things like that, like what they used to do in the 70s. So I don't know, maybe an alien abduction? I, I have no idea. <laughs> How much does that impact on you growing up and your and your kind of understanding of politics and? Um, well, um, the crisis of Venezuela is very um, it's very clear to us. It has been very clear since uh, since the uh, I mean 2010s, for example. I mean, people have been fledging fledging from there and 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 staying in Argentina. So, like everybody you you would meet who works. Uh, like you know, are, are Venezuelans, and and I, I mean, I work as a journalist. I know a lot of people who can't um, who can't have works anymore. Who just, I mean, right. have been, I mean, pers- I mean, persecuted, or like, I mean, like, I mean, threats to kill them, and etc. And had to leave. And in the same time, at the same time, I'm I'm also in touch with with. Cuban women journalists who suffer a lot, for example, they are sieged in their own houses. They cannot leave their houses for days and days because there is police outside that would take them to jail. Like, throughout, for example, during this whole year in Cuba, there have been manifestations saying, um, patria y vida, which means like life and 
and country, if you like. And because because one of the, what I mean, one of the slogans, the horrible slogans of, of this, um, this, these are populist regimes that have turned into dictatorships. So these are like left left uh, discoursed uh, governance that have you know that that in the case of Cuba are there since you know since the revolution, but in the case of of Venezuela, they stage fake elections and they keep winning them all the time. They, it's a government that basically has the control of the military forces. And so, the, I mean, so the civilian po- population has absolutely, they cannot do absolutely anything. And and just to tell you one thing, for example, like Nicolás Maduro, he, he was a truck driver. I mean, and I'm sure that there are many amazing and brilliant truck drivers, but not, to, I mean, but not really, it's, it's not like the kind of person that you would like, you know, running the country. Uh, and also, you know, for like 10 or 15 years without no map whatsoever of what they're going to do. And just, you know, um, I mean, being super rich, I mean, they're absolute millionaires while people are starving. So that's also the issue. Like people are starving in Cuba, people are starving in Venezuela, and this is why they're they're just running away. I mean, they cannot have their lives there anymore. And so it's splitting families. It's, it's a whole drama. And when did you become aware, like your, your childhood growing up in Argentina, when did you first start to become well interested and aware of what was happening and asking questions? Well, I, I think I was interested in what was happening in Cuba since very early on because, um, well, when when... When I, when I was born, for example, my aunt she was a fighter for the revolution, right? So she was mm-hmm. a guerrilla. So she had be, she disappeared for some time during the dictatorship, and then she appeared. Wow. So my family was always connected with some leftism discourse, you know, with with the bad parts and the good parts of it. I mean, the, the interest, you know, in in making the world a better place, but at the same time, like all the dark side connected to that. So we would like we would see like. <laughs> that even though there was this like benevolent discourse towards Cuba as this amazing place that fights capitalism where every, you know, where communism reign and, and everybody has access to the same things was actually not real that, you know, I would, I, I, I went to Cuba and, and I don't know, I mean, little girls are, are getting prostituted on the streets just to, you know, for a little soap. It's just, it's harrowing. And this has been harrowing for just so long that people tend to forget, but this, these are generations um, that that are being destroyed by this regime, and it's basically the same thing. It's it's a um, it's a government that is in control of the military forces and the civilians. Well, you know, you have to suck it up or do whatever the regime wants, and you know, be I mean, adulate the regime, say that they're wonderful, and um, and that's the only way for you to survive. And so there are, there are all these women um, journalists that are like, no, this is an absolute patriarchal system where, where women have no right to, are not given any voice, are not given any freedom. And and they, I mean, in my, I mean, my friends, they cannot leave their house. Mm. <laughs> so it's, it's quite terrible. Well, how is it for male journalists? Is it very different? No, no. A lot of a lot of people in culture have been making like hunger strikes, for example, just to be heard. But the thing is, the government cuts down the internet, so we don't have we don't know anymore. So right. this this has been like massive massive walk, saying like we have to revolutionize the revolution. We have to change. You know what what was maybe good maybe. 50 years ago, it's not good anymore. We're like, we're starving. I mean, like, please, let's let's change this. And, and they, they just wouldn't listen to that. And, and they would jail people. They would jail, like, you know, very young people, like adolescents. And and now we, we don't know that much because they just, you know, they just cut the internet. So, mm-hmm. so and so that's what they do, basically. The, the story winds down. People forget about it. And... Because, yeah, you, you, you need, like, news all the time, people all the time talking about this. Do you still um, write, you still investigate, you still report um, as a journalist on these things or you've moved away from, from that kind of work? No, well, I, I write a column for uh, uh, In La Nación about, like, uh, political matters in Argentina. Uh, now it's the summer, <laughs> so, so people are, are, aren't doing it, aren't doing that, but I'm, I'm coming back in March. Right. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting what you say about the power of the internet, you know, that power of communication being so cru- crucial underpinning these like strongman regimes, you know, Bolsonaro and Putin and Trump, who's now 
happily been deposed. Um, do you feel optimistic that you know we we the, we the people and the kind of myriad ways that we can communicate now can kind of figure out clever ways of stepping by that 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 cutting off of communications? I, I think it's the only thing that that. I mean, that is left for us, unfortunately. Mm. And that for that reason, it's we have to use it. Like, mm. it's, it's our only weapon to talk mm. about it, to, to like, keep raising awareness about it, to, I don't know, to make people know that, that, that no, it's, I mean, populism is not a nice thing to have in Latin America. <laughs> I mean, yes. it's, it's just not, it's, it's not a viable regime. It's not, it's not an option. I, I feel like people just like talk so simplistically. I mean, my Cuban friends, for example, when they listen to Lady Gaga saying like, capitalism is so bad for women. I'm like, <laughs> really? I mean, like, you're completely, you're up swimming in millions of dollars. And like, you're, yeah. you are saying that capitalism is bad. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's outrageous. What yeah. these people want, in fact, is, is, is the possibility to live like using their work and their talent and they're denied that possibility. That's why yeah. they have to flee. Because the only the only thing that you can do is abide by what but what the state says and say, Yes, yes, my leader, yes, you are absolutely yeah. right. And then and, and, and then maybe they'll give you a little bread. It's awful. Right. There's a great line in Mona that I pulled out when I was reading it because it made me think about this and your work your other work as a journalist and the, the line is whatever distance we can put between ourselves and hatred that's freedom that's all the freedom we're likely to get so basically you're kind of talking about i think or maybe you know you tell me what you're talking about in that quote and and and, and more largely what we're talking about now well i i feel that that yeah there are all these discourses of hatred that are a way to disembody societies from their connection to their collective soul. It's just, it's excruciating how they tear apart societies completely. Um, I've seen that happening in Argentina, for example, because where, where the government has a very strong uh, discourse against journalists, for example, saying that they are the new, that the, the I mean, Christina, <laughs> Christina Kirchner, the vice president, said, like, um, a month ago or so, she said that back in the 70s, the dictatorship had uh, people torturing. But now it's much easier because the new torturers are the journalists with their pens and with their media. So she basically mm -hmm. equated, I mean, I mean, of course, she was absolutely banalizing the horrors of the dictatorship, but at the same time, putting the journalists in the position of the enemies of the yeah. state, the enemies of Argentina, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Yeah. Because yeah. it can arouse, you know, a lot of hate, I mean, a lot of hatred in civilians saying like, oh, you are my enemy now because yeah. you criticize the government. And yeah. Then, that is really, that's what Trump did, isn't it? He made, he made the press the enemy. Absolutely. Yeah. Another populist. But this is like, yeah. left, I mean, it's a populism, but, you know, with a, left, with a leftist discourse, it's the same kind of problem. Mm. At, but, mm. I mean, my friends at La Nación, I mean, they had like their tires broken, like inside, inside of, the, of the newspaper. Imagine that. So like yeah. there's this constant, constant threats and constant... On the, on the one side, the threats, and on the, on the other side, the threat, like giving out money, like actual money, to the people that are nice to them. So mm -hmm. if you are poor, if you don't have like a lot of opportunities, if you're like, well, you know, I have like this job, what can I do? Yeah, okay, I'm going to, if you want me to say beautiful things about you, government, okay, I'll say them. So that's the situation. That's how you fuel hatred at the same time, because you buy out a lot of people while you threaten and menace those who wouldn't, you know, wouldn't bother. I mean, wouldn't abide to that or are stronger for any, for any other reasons. Yeah. So Mona is, is actually doing that life that I, that path of life that I didn't take. And so she, she's actually there. She's working there. And I, and I lived there for like four years or so, which was during the, it was the Trump years, um, which was, was incredible <laughs> because yeah. again, an enemy, I was, you know, it was a person of color, which I didn't know by then because in Latin America, we don't, and in Europe, people don't use them. So for me, it was like, I take a plane, I get inside the States and I become a person of color. I take the same plane back, back out 
I just cross the frontier and I'm not a person of color. And maybe something ontologically changed in me uh, <laughs> that made me a person of color in that place. And I don't know. But, well, uh, so it was super interesting to realize that I was this person of color, that there were, you know, things that were expected of me. And there was like a, a role that I was supposed to play in this host new society that I have, that I had, uh, that I was in. And so this, this was a lot of inspiration for Mon as well, because uh, um, I realized that, um, that in a way um, you're in, you're, you're, you're typically, I mean, you're asked to do some lip service to the society that is your host, because this, this makes, you know, the society that is the host, like, feel like so generous and, and, and wonderful. Like, look, we also have some people of color here talking, like, look at that. How amazing <laughs> is that? Um, but at the same time, like, it, like, you wouldn't really you weren't really asked to talk about literature. It was always like, well, so from your position of a Latin American woman, person of color, etc., is there anything you, you'd like, a, like a little footnote that you'd like to say? So people weren't talking about literature anymore. Literature was still like reserved for, you know, the, the old man, uh, you know, with the white bears, etc. I think that is changing. But at the same time, it's, I think it's a fun uh, conversation to have, um, like what? What is what is expected of us as as people of color? I really like the idea of moving across a boundary and, and becoming a different ethnicity as well. It's a brilliant kind of visual. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Okay, let's move on to your your second change. You want to explain that to us? Make Latin mandatory in state-run primary schools, and then move on to include ancient Greek. I think this would provide a lot of work for literary people. And the society would be definitely enriched because we would be less prone to be engulfed by politicians who use Latinate constructions as a way of something cultivated or clever. I, I mean, for example, like Boris Johnson, he does it all the time. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> the, the minute you say that, I, I, you hear like children across the country go, "No, <laughs> it's the worst idea ever." <laughs> But then you counter it by saying, but then you would, you would be able to counter bluster the nonsense of Boris Johnson and, and Jacob Rees-Mogg. And so they'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in. So yeah, carry on. Yeah, like every, anybody can be like, like their own like uh, Latin Superman. And, and, <laughs> and truly, I think the humanities are going to be more and more important as artificial intelligence advance and keep on and as software itself, like keeps rolling over the world. Um, because th there's one thing that the uh, intel artificial intelligence like won't figure out on their own is like, is the past, is the intricacies of human behavior and it's all those things that are trapped and that are coded inside uh, inside Latin, inside the classics, inside ancient Greek, and inside, you know, all, you know, the, the richness of uh, Romance languages as well, because mm. when you learn Latin, then it's much easier to, to learn, you know, the Romance languages. So how do you think society would change? What difference would you see if we did bring Latin back and ancient Greek? It would change us a lot because a lot of people would have, like, I, I mean, for example, um, have people teaching Latin, everybody would be like, oh, like feeling the yum, you know, inside of them. It's the same way as they feel Shakespeare. They would feel like, oh, it's the ending. And this would create like, you know, like a, a, a special music throughout the UK, throughout, throughout Europe, truly. Um, and I, I think it would be really special. And I think we will be like better, better equipped to deal with with artificial intelligence in the end, with, with I mean, with the with the further development of, of the world in, in in its technical sense. I love it. I love the idea of it. I look like, yeah, you're putting me in mind of that Odysseus, mate. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> be amazing conversation would be so much more rich <laughs> <laughs> i just you you mentioned ai then and there's a there's a, a section in, in in mona where you talk all the characters or some of the characters talk about ai and their the theoretical possibility of of a robot being able to write a novel um and i think the date in the book is something very near like 2048 they've kind of is that a, is that a real piece of research or is that poetic license by the author Oh no! A, a lot of people are are, um, are are toying with that possibility uh, of, of entire books of fiction uh, written by um, 
by artificial intelligences. Most, I mean, many artificial intelligences are now being trained to imitate the classics. You, you can see that the machine has something like that that can be likened to an imagination, because like weird things are out, are out there that were not like proposed by men. And so it's like in this like tiny moments, it's like well, the computer is doing something as thinking as imagining a possibility. So that's kind of kind of beautiful. But yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that 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 this character, uh, who's a Colombian writer who likes um, to talk about like technology and is kind of like his thing, um, he he thinks that uh, Google is you know a, a great novel. So everybody's kind of like working as you know as a character that types itself up you know in the novel. So that you have you have Facebook, you have like all these places like little outlets where everybody plays their character in this like massive novel uh, where, where people like try to do, try to be likable. It's as if it, I mean, it was like the biggest uh, representation effort of mankind uh, to, to have like this absolute massive novel. So in a way there is already a novel going on that we're all like partaking, that we're all participating in and and yes, and 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 then there then there are these other uh, experiments of people saying like, well, I mean, let's do this like young adults, etc., that would have to have this kind of, I mean, for example, is I mean, a lot of people like measure how long the attention span is sustained. So a computer could definitely do that. Okay, so it's like five minutes of attention. Then if it drops, you have to do this. Then you have to do this other thing in order to keep like the attention going. But I mean, this is just part of, um, I don't know, of understanding how cognition works. And it's kind of like, it, it's interesting to, to also think about novels in that sense. It's not. So um, do, you, do you speak Latin and Greek or, or either of them? Oh, no, of course not. I, I don't speak, I don't speak no, neither Latin nor Greek. I, but I, I did study them a little bit when, when, I, was, when I was at school. And, and I, also, I always felt like, oh, this is so beautiful. And, and it made me think so much. It, like, it made me, it awakened, you know, this, the idea of syntax in me. I was like, oh, my God, there's subjects and predicates. And before that, I haven't really feel them in my own language just because like you see them in this other language. It's just, I mean, it becomes like so much beautiful. And so, so I don't know. So I, when, I don't know, I was going to, to school and they, they were had there was some Latin going on and, yeah. and it was good for, for your math skills as well. It was, it was kind yeah. of like, it was something that vertebrated everything. And even if it feels like very outlandish yeah. and very antiquated, it's, it's quite beautiful. So let's do it, right. Boris. If you could do it, we can all do it. Well, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head. I think Latin probably is mandatory in private schools here. Um, it's just that state schools don't get it. So you, you've you've nailed that in your in your request. Um, and also, kids like myths and legends is like the stuff of kids' dreams. You know, like all the all the tale, all the you know the iconography and the stories would be it'd be a it'd be the most popular teacher in school. I love it. It's so beautiful. Exactly. Um, let's move on to your final um, change, which is. Um, well, it's pretty out there. So <laughs> just just tell, tell us what you, what it is. I think we should put together a space elevator that allows us to build the necessary infrastructure to become an interplanetary species. <laughs> Simple. Love it. I mean, where did this come from? Well, I mean, you know, the climate cha- the, the climate crisis is real, and we are fighting the climate change. But at the same time, we also need to keep growing economically if we want to take people out of poverty and, and if we want to keep having, you know, jobs and things to do and et cetera. Like, so, so these two things cannot go together because, I mean, they would obliterate each other. So in order to keep growing, we need to create the world outside of the planet. So if we build a space elevator, this would allow us to kind of like to take a train to, I mean, to lower orbit, I'm not saying Jupiter, I'm saying lower orbit, where, where the space stations are. There are different space stations already, but if there is a space elevator created, this would allow us to, to create the infrastructure because, you know, you know, you need to, I mean, there's a lot of lithium outside. There are a lot of like rare metals that are worth so much money. And so, um, and so if this space elevator is created, then it would be much easier to kind of like, hey, you take a train 
to this to the space station and from there you can like go like and start like mining stuff to to bring the metals down and so you bring out the gdp of the earth into lower orbit instead of like making the gdp inside of the earth yeah. and and then destroying the amazons for example because you know if we keep having economic like very strong and growing yeah. economical growth we're going to destroy the planet this is a really well thought out and reasonable argument but what's happening in my head is that i i just can it, what look it looks like in a shopping center just an endless escalator going up with just a person in a space suit <laughs> just stand, standing patiently i also think space elevator sounds really quite sexy but in the uk we would call it a space lift Lift is actually more airy. I think it should be renamed Space Lift. Right, I've gone straight to Escalator. That's what I... <laughs> escalator? That's what's in my head. I mean, that would take years. That's what I thought. That's why I was like, this isn't going to work. <laughs> I mean, Catherine, you're not in blue water. You need to... See, that's what I mean. It, in my head, it's like we're in blue water with a really big, steep thing going up forever. Oh okay. So yeah. it's more Willy Wonka. It's like the chocolate factory, the lift going out of the top of the chocolate factory. That's, yes. that's a better visual for me. Yeah. If that doesn't help anyone else. <laughs> Excellent. Have you thought about, um, this probably isn't on your, in part of your business plan, but, but this is where I've also gone. Like into, into, bre into species breeding and what attributes we are looking for as a species, what we might be able to offer passing aliens. Is that part of what you've thought about with this? Well, I'm definitely interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> we would definitely have to, yeah, to, to send out some 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 very eligible um, <laughs> humans to see what's going on. Because maybe if they mate with an alien species, we would have the solution to the to the to end the dictatorship in Cuba and Venezuela and etc. Because it would be just aliens, you know, at the end of the day. And they would just like, you know, overthrow the, those governments and, and free the people there. And and hopefully also put like a, a nice uh, human loving uh, government. And maybe speaking Latin. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got any candidates for going, you know, the, the first breeders? Who would we send up? Oh because you the, said the best of our species and that's yeah. that. <laughs> the very best <laughs> yeah, but, then, but then he doesn't come back like he just stays there well I guess I guess we had to mend between ourselves what can we do <laughs> <laughs> oh I see it's all a devious plot to put them in the elevator and send them <laughs> off I love it <laughs> well, I, I read that so many women are so uh, interested in him. I read, I read in the UK press that like, did he write that? He might have written that. <laughs> it's one of the wonders of the world. It's a great unsolved mystery: how he's managed to have so many children with so many women. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I like it. I'm sold. <laughs> I'm completely sold on this idea. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, on that note, <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming on the show. What have you got lined up next? What are you doing? I know you've got to take the Pavlova out of the oven, but on a, a longer scale. Um, I Well, we're doing a show uh, at, at Open Book and with the BBC uh, with Valerie Mines, who's a fantastic translator. She's translating Borges. And, and I think that should be coming up like in two weeks or so. Um, Great. Yeah. Brilliant. Yes, yeah, and I, and I really can't wait to, to go back to London. So, so hopefully. great. Well, we can't wait to have you. Yeah, and really, really good luck with the book launch and, and everything yes. that happens. And it was published course. yesterday, I think, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it just came out. Congratulations, yes, fantastic. It's a fantastic book. All right, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. World as it should be from Prima Donna.